I wanted to turn to the relationship between Castro and Nelson Mandela, of course, the South African president in prison for decades himself. In 1991, a year after he was freed, uh, and a few years before he became president, Nelson Mandela visited Cuba um, to thank President Fidel Castro. This is when they first met. Before we say anything, Antes de hablar absolutamente de cualquier tema, you must tell me when you are coming to South me Africa. Me tiene que decir cuándo viene para Sudáfrica. Lo yo sé, no, 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 and our friend Cuba, y nuestro amigo Cuba, which helped us in training our people, que nos ayudó a entrenar a nuestra gente, gave us resources to get out with our struggle, que nos ayudaron tanto nuestra gente, trained our people que as doctors and so on. A nuestros médicos. You have not come to our country. Cuba no ha venido a visitarnos. Usted no ha ido a visitarnos. When are you coming? ¿Cuándo viene? <laughs> no he visitado a mi patria surafricana. I haven't visited my South African homeland yet. La quiero como una patria. I want it. I love it as quiero a homeland. Y por el pueblo. I love it as a homeland as I love you and the South African well, people. Are you that was Nelson Mandela imploring Fidel Castro to come to South Africa. And this is Fidel Castro speaking in South Africa uh, in 1998. Conviértase Sudáfrica en un en modelo de un mundo futuro más justo y más humano. Let South Africa be a model of a more just and more humane future. Si ustedes pueden, todos podemos. If you can do it, we will all be able to do it. That was Fidel Castro speaking in South Africa, and before that, uh, Nelson Mandela, just after he got out of jail, visiting Castro in Cuba to invite him to South Africa. Bill Fletcher, talk about the relationship of uh, Cuba, uh, Fidel Castro, with the continent of Africa and liberation struggles there. Well, you know, it's interesting, Amy, because there was a special relationship that existed between the Cuban Revolution and Africa from almost the, the, uh, the beginning. The, the Cubans were very supportive of the Algerian struggle against the French, which succeeded in 1962. Um, they, uh, they went on to support the various anti-colonial uh, movements in Africa, including and particularly the anti-Portuguese movements in Guinea-Bissau, Angola and, and Mozambique. And they were uh, unquestioning in their support for the anti-apartheid struggle in, uh, in uh, South Africa. It's the Angolan struggle that receives a lot of attention. And one of the things that was not understood at the time by many of us in the United States, including many of us on the left, was that when Cuban troops went to Angola, they did not go at the behest of the Soviet Union. In fact, the Soviet Union was not in favor of Cuban troops going there. The Cubans went there uh, out of a, a sense of solidarity. I mean, they actually believed in solidarity. And they went there to stop the invasion that was in the process of taking place between uh, by the South African apartheid troops and their uh, allies in the FNLA and UNITA. Um, and so this relationship has been very, very strong. And you could tell in the words of the late President Mandela uh, that this bond, this love for the Cuban people and for the Cuban revolution, that bond also translated into a feeling in black America of, of a certain kind of bond, a certain support for the Cuban uh, revolution, feeling that this was a revolution that paid attention to Africa, but also paid attention to the struggle around racism within Cuba, although, obviously, there were certain limitations to that. But I would say that Cuba probably made the greatest advances in the struggle around racism of any country in the Western Hemisphere.
to turn to Cuba's role in Angola. This is a clip from the 2001 documentary Fidel, The Untold Story, that was directed by Estela Bravo. You hear the narrator, Vlastovrana, first. Right from the beginning, Cuba's revolutionary ideals not only spread throughout Latin America, but also forged strong ties with national liberation leaders, such as Secu Touré, Amircal Cabral, Julius Nyerere, Zamora Machel, and Agostino Neto. When the regular South African troops invaded Angola, we couldn't stand by and do nothing. When the MPLA asked for our help, we offered them the help they needed. In 1975, as Angola moved towards independence from Portugal, the CIA, along with the apartheid government of South Africa, tried to bring down the new Angolan government. At the request of the Angolan president, Fidel sent 36,000 troops to keep the South African forces from attacking Luanda, the capital. For many Cubans, whose ancestors were African slaves, the fight in Angola was a way to repair a debt to history. In 14 years of war, over 300,000 Cubans, doctors, teachers and engineers, as well as soldiers, played an important role in Angola more than 2,000 lost their lives. In 1988, Fidel sent in more Cuban troops for the decisive battle at Quito Cuanavale and directed operations from Cuba. The defeat of the South African army drove a large nail into the coffin of apartheid and helped advance the struggle of the South African people. That's a clip from the 2001 documentary Fidel, The Untold Story, directed by Estela Bravo. Um, now let's go to the film CIA and Angolan Revolution. In this clip, former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger explains why the U.S. was concerned about the Cuban troops that Fidel Castro had sent to fight in Angola. After Kissinger, you hear Fidel Castro himself. We thought, with respect to Angola, that if the Soviet Union could intervene at such distances, from areas that were far from the traditional Russian security concerns. And when Cuban forces could be introduced in to distant trouble spots, and if the West could not find a counter to that, that then the whole international system could be destabilized. It was a question of globalizing our struggle vis-a-vis -vis the globalized pressures and harassment of the U.S. In this respect, it did not coincide with the Soviet viewpoint. We acted, but without their cooperation. Quite the opposite. That from the film CIA and the Angolan Revolution, Bill Fletcher as we wrap up this section on Cuba in Africa. There's a story that I heard, Amy, about what happened in Angola on the night of independence. And there was panic in the capital. Uh, South African troops and their allies were approaching, and no one knew what was going to happen. And then, at midnight, people went down to the docks and out of the darkness came Cuban troops, Cuban ships, that then landed troops. And, and the look on the, the face of the person who told me the story, who witnessed this, was something that I'll never forget, that this, the sense that they had been saved at a, at a critical moment in an act that had not been driven by the Soviet Union, but had been driven by a belief in solidarity and a particular relationship between Cuba and Africa. And that's something that the U.S. mainstream media is completely ignoring at this moment. And Che Guevara would be in Africa, right, fighting uh, for correct. leading Cuban forces before he would ultimately die in Latin America. That's correct. He went to the Democratic Republic of the Congo and was fighting a neocolonial regime uh, that, uh, ironically, he was working with uh, Kabila, Laurent Kabila, uh, in the beginning. But the forces there were very poorly organized. They weren't really ready to carry out a revolution. And the Cuban uh, advisors uh, withdrew, ultimately, because the conditions were not ripe. Mm. 
Uh, speaking about Che, I thought I would turn right now to Che Guevara. I want to turn to another clip from the film Fidel, the untold story, uh, directed by Estela Bravo. This is Fidel Castro talking about Che Guevara following his execution in Bolivia in 1967. Si if we want a model of a man who belongs not to our time, but to the future, I would say with all my heart that that model is Che. In 1997, three decades after he was killed, Che Guevara's remains were found and returned to Cuba. Fidel Castro talked more about him in the film Fidel. I dream about him often. I dream that I'm talking to him, that he's alive. It's a very special thing. It's hard to accept the fact that he's dead. Why is that? I'd say it's because he's always present. Always present everywhere. That from Fidel by Estela Bravo. We're going to go to break and then come back and talk about the effect of Cuba and Fidel Castro and Che Guevara in Latin America. This is Democracy Now! as we look at the life and legacy of Fidel Castro. He died on Friday at the age of 90. Stay with us.